audible and visible if so give me a hi hello how are you doing i hope i'm audible and visible i think so just give me a second okay great so good evening everyone so this is the last session of for so i stay couldn't complete the breast pathology uh, for a classes in the it is like so we just taking a little bit of time to cover what was required from a university point of view with regards to breast pathology is breast cancer yes everyone will sh- must have known that this one of the important topics in coming the viva or in the university exam as well because breast cancer is the most common cancer which is plagued our country and the world so we'll have to know about the breast cancer a little bit before going to breast cancer there are few lesions which are must for an undergraduate you know even though if it's not been asked in your second year of mbbs definitely for sure when you come to your final year you will be reading about fibroadenoma you will definitely see patients of fibroadenoma and fill outs in surgery so at least to form that base we'll have an understanding about fibroadenoma fill outs and a little bit about breast cancer fine so we're ready for the game as usual let's start and let's discuss and learn more about things fine okay so first uh, tell me hello hi kustha good evening parul hi afsar so uh, just to start with uh but you, from the term fibroadenoma what do you understand i just want everyone here to comment is it an epithelial tumor is it a mesenchymal tumor or is a mix of both epithelial and mesenchymal tumor it's fibroadenoma what do you think it is from the term fibroadenoma i'm sure you can understand that there are two components here fibro is your mesenchymal component and adenoma is an epithelial component right so there are two components here fibro and adenoma perfect of self right Okay, Raga. Uh, for you, this answer. If you've done exceptionally well in prelims, please go ahead. Excellence comes only when you repeat it again and again and again. You have done your good job. If you want to excel, please pull it through or teach someone who requires your knowledge. That way, you also grow together. Fine. Okay. Uh, Oxy Kush, this lectures for a current second year student who is going for your university exam. If you're a new second year, we'll read them in details very soon. Fine. Okay. It's a mixture of epithelial mesenchymal component. of these components uh, this is undoubtedly the most common benign tumor which is seen in the breast cap parenchyma which i'm sure you will know fine next here so if i have if i have a fibro component and adenomatous component of these two component which is stronger fibrous component is stronger or adenomatous component is stronger like i say epithelial component or adenomatous component is nothing but your glands right it is glands or in your breast parenchyma i am going to call it duct lobular unit on the other hand the mesenchymal tissue fibrous tissue is in In- intermediate stroma perfect obviously the fibrous component is way stronger than the epithelial component right perfect so can i say by default the stronger fibrous component right there's a stronger part there's a stronger fibrous component can compress the epithelium is there a possibility it can just compress the epithelium it can and it will right so once it's compressed the fibroadenoma kind of is going to look like this this is the basic understanding of fibroadenoma if you understand this you can extrapolate gross you can extrapolate microscopy and you can extrapolate fnac right so let's assume there's a thick fibrous component here unfortunately the epithelial component is completely compressed and the ductal component becomes thin here it becomes extremely compressed so instead of having a gland here with an opening it become compressed like this and this is what's going to happen in the fibroadenoma it's just being compressed by the thick fibrous component so it's getting compressed by the thick fibrous component when you see the gross can i say i can see a slit like space the same thing can be seen in gross in gross morphology fibroadenoma you will see slit like spaces again if you have a sample of fibroadenoma in your uh, for an, uh, your uh, jar specimen you can explain that this is slit like space in gross it's a very well defined tumor very very mobile tumor because it is benign any benign tumor is going to be well defined in mobile right the same thing when you do an fnac see fnac is a fine needle aspiration cytology right So if I'm going to put uh, again, I'll come back to you only to ask this question. I'm going to put a needle and I'm going to aspirate something. Which you think will easily come out in the needle? The thick fibrous component or the thin one? Okay, medico. Uh, if I am an examiner, I would concentrate on the breast cancer. I'll give you a history of let's say 55 year old person, heart swelling in the breast parenchyma. What will be the diagnosis? the way to approach and the way to classify that because breast cancer is definitely the major one this fibroadenoma fillers might be useful for you to understand the um jar specimens or the practical parts fine so if we take out say the thin epithelial component will come out say so the epithelial component here will be out and this epithelial component will have the same appearance it looks like this it's a compressed epithelium right so kind of it looks like this how does it look how does it resemble 
If you have to relate, does it look like a deer's horn or a stag's horn? So this appearance calls an antler horn appearance, right? Antler is a stag, the deer. Antler horn appearance, that's how it looks. The deer's horn, it looks like that, right? That's how fibroadenoma looks like and that's the FNAC. And if you take a biopsy, this is what I'm going to see in biopsy. I'll see both epithelial component and fibrous component. The fibrous component is going to be pink in color and the epithelial component is going to be compressed with each other. In your organs, there will be two things given as intracanalicular and pericanalicular. To be honest, that distinction is not required at all. It's just fibroadenoma that's more than enough, right? So with this understanding of the name, we extrapolated the gross. It's a very solid lesion. And can you appreciate the slit like spaces? Definitely there are slit like spaces, right? And they're very well circumscribed. Okay? I'll have very solid lesion and very well circumscribed lesion. That's how fibroadenoma looks in the gross. In an FNAC, like we extrapolated and we learned, it looks like an antler's horn. This is an FNAC appearance of an antler horn appearance, which is diagnosed called fibroadenoma and it's very cohesive, right? Cohesiveness is also very, very important. When I say cohesive, I'll just zoom this. Is it one cell or multiple cells? Multiple, right? Multiple cells forming a part clustering to each other. It's a very cohesiveness and it's an antler horn appearance, right? That's for FNAC. And biopsy, this is your biopsy or your post excision biopsy. You see the fibrous component here, the, in the fibroadenoma, the fibrous component and you can see the compressed duct parenchyma. Anywhere in fibroadenoma, you'll have compressed duct and you'll see the fibrous component surrounding them. That's a classical picture of a fibroadenoma. This image will almost be similar to your prostatic hyperplasia. But in prostatic hyperplasia, the glands are a little bit more, but here it's more the fibrous component, compresses the gland and it looks like that, right? That's how a fibroadenoma looks like. What do you think is the treatment of fibroadenoma? It's a simple treatment. It's excision, right? It's just excision. You have to excise that. That's more than enough for a simple treatment of fibroadenoma. Fine. Just a word about few words about phyllodes. Phyllodes is also a tumor seen in breast. We divide phyllodes into benign. It's same like what you see in ovarian tumor. You have borderline phyllodes and also you have malignant phyllodes. The distinction between benign, borderline and malignant is left to the pathologist, right? You need not know how do I differentiate benign, borderline and malignant. We just need to know there are three things here. Hello, Saha. Hope you're doing good. Right? So in phyllodes, uh, textbooks say that phyllodes happens in around middle reproductive age, right? 30 to 50 years of life. But in reality, phyllodes can happen in any woman with a breast parenchyma. That's how the phyllodes is. I just want you to keep in mind only one thing. Whenever you see any question, your second year university exam or your neat exam next exam or even in real life when you see a lesion which is close to more than 10 centimeter a very large lesion fleshy lesion sperm you think of a philostoma the size is the one which is going to help you to diagnose a clove phyllos. there is a possibility it could be a giant fibroadenoma also but still i would want you to keep a possibility of phyllos. the biggest problem with phyllos is that's the biggest grave concern is they recur a lot. Even some benign phyllodes, they recur. It's not just intermediate or malignant. Even benign phyllodes recurs. So that's one of the biggest concerns of phyllodes. Phyllodes, there are two things here. In gross, it's called as a cut cabbage appearance. I'm not sure how a cabbage looks. Does a cabbage looks like this? I'm sure you must have seen cabbage. That doesn't look like cabbage. More or less than very fleshy tumor. Fully solid area, not much of a cystic architecture. And microscopy of phyllodes is very, very important as well. In microscopy, this might come in a viva question. It has something called a leaf-like appearance. It might not look like a leaf for you, but yes, if I can draw something out of it, yes, kind of looks like a leaf, right? If I can draw something out of it, yes, it looks like a leaf. It's more of the stromal tumor, and the leaf-like appearance is a classical finding for phyllodes, right? These are two things about fibroderma and phyllodes. Just a few uh, words for our wisdom, right? And let's go to breast cancer. Breast cancer is important for an undergraduate perspective. I want you guys to know breast cancer. Definitely, even if you don't read now, when you go to surgery, I'm 100% sure you will read about breast cancer. Because breast cancer is a long case in surgery. You will know in and about, about breast cancer. And if you're a second year MBBS student, I would urge you to go and read about self-breast examination. That's very, very important. And please teach your mother, sister, whoever is at home. Because breast cancer is the most common cancer in the world. It's very common. Breast cancer it takes close to 40 to 50% of incidence of all the cancers throughout. 
So self plus examination is an easy, inexpensive way, less sensitive. I do agree. It's a very easy way which can be done by the women to see if there's a lump or not. If there's a lump, let them go to a doctor and investigate it. Fine. Let's look at the etiopathology of breast cancer. The breast cancer, when you look at breast cancer, there are two important things I want you to remember. One is sporadic etiology. The other is the genetic ones or inherited risk factor. Right? It's both sporadic as well as genetic can cause spread cancer. Uh, can anyone tell me what comes to your mind when you think of breast cancer, risk factor of breast cancer? Anything which comes to your mind. I just want you to comment on anything whatever comes to your mind. What comes to your mind when you think of breast cancer? Any etiology? Anyone? At least something will come apart from your BRCA1, BRCA2. Anything comes to your mind regarding breast cancer? Arushal, you are right. Like I said, apart from BRCA1 and BRCA2. Because BRCA1 is something which has been very much concentrated on and we are trying to kind of ignore the rest which is more important for me. Okay, undoubtedly BRCA1, BRCA2 genes are there. In addition to that, there are many, many things. So, uh, there is a concept called as relative risk. Okay, there is something called as relative risk. You will read more about relative risk when you come to your third year and your PSM. I am not sure if you have learnt about PSM now. Something, a concept, a term called as relative risk. So, when I say relative risk is 2, which means that etiology or that thing makes the risk of developing cancer twice compared to a normal person. BRCA1 gene, let's assume. If a person has BRCA1 mutation, it is said that it has a relative risk of more than 4. More than 4 times the woman is at risk if they have BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation compared to the general population, right? So this is a concept called as relative risk and we'll classify the etiology based on the relative risk. So like I said, we classify them into three groups, relative risk of more than four. For both genetics, that as well as sporadic, we classify like this only. Relative risk of more than four, two to four and one to two. One relative risk means no increased risk, right? It said that just being born as a female gender increases the relative risk by more than four. That's all. Female gender and increased age. So BRCA1 also increases the relative risk by four. More than four, but gender and age alone increase the relative risk by four. So we are being focused on something which is very very minuscule. Just it excites us. Braca one, braca two gene has no very less implication. Just being born as a woman and being elderly as a woman increases risk of breast cancer. Same with prostate cancer. Men and age is the most important risk of prostate carcinoma as well. Right here and one more important thing, which yes should be considered is high breast density. Density of the breast and the size of the breast is not the same. So there are imaging guidance to say that the breast is very dense. When I say very dense, it has very high um, unit ratio of, of your adipose tissue. When the adipose tissue is more, it becomes hormonally active and causes problem. Again, when you come to radiology in your final year, you learn what are the tests will tell me the breast density is more or high. Ultrasonogram can give and MRI can give to some extent. Fine. And obviously your genetics. In genetics, not every genetics will increase the risk, relative risk by more than 4. There are few genes which I want you to remember. Like Rushil said, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. BRCA1 accounts to close to 55% case of inherited uh, breast cancer, 55%. And BRCA2 is to 35%, right? So one BRCA1 is in chromosome 17. You have risk of breast cancer, not just breast. It also increases risk of ovarian cancer, pancreas, prostate. If it's in men, obviously it can increase the risk of prostate cancer as well. Okay. And BRCA2 increases the risk of uh, a male breast cancer especially. I am not saying it will not be involved in female breast. It will be involved in female breast cancer also. If it's women, breast, ovary, pancreas. Again, that's a common template here. Fine. Which famous actress told to the entire world about BRCA1 and BRCA2? The famous person did a mastectomy and oophorectomy saying that she was BRCA1 and BRCA2 positive. Angel Nanjoli, right? Thanks to her, every person in the world now knows about BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. And I wish that Angelina Julie has come up and told about cell breast examination because that is more important than this. Right? And for all doctors listening here, please remember cell breast examination. That is way more important than my BRCA1 and BRCA2 in identifying the uh, risk of breast cancer. Right? Apart from that, I have few minuscule. These are, like I said, these are 90%. These are like less than 1%. Uh, TP53. P53 can be mutated, leaf from leaf syndrome. P10 mutation, Cowden syndrome, which you read in your GIT, STK11, which syndrome, Fuchs-Jagger syndrome, 
and we have CDH1, lobular carcinoma. All these are just one person. The chunk, 90 persons, BRCA1 and BRCA2. If you know that, that's more than enough for me. This is relative risk of more than four. A relative risk of two to four. It is there twice to four times. So two to four relative risk. Uh, again, I have genetic mutation and there's a history of radiation. See, if a patient has a, let's assume just for an example, a person has a lung cancer, you irradiate the lung tumor, definitely breast comes in the place, right? Hodgkin's lymphoma or a mediastinal tumor, I irradiate them, breast parenchyma will definitely be affected. So history of radiation to, uh, to the chest area at a young age increase the risk. Apart from that, obviously your genetics. Of the genetics, which all involves like two to four, very, very less percentage, again, one per approximately five to one percentage, right? ATM, ataxia telangiectasia mutated, okay? That's ATM stands for ataxia telangiectasia. And then you have one more thing called check two. Okay? So these two are classically associated with later risk of two to four, fine, okay? So we know about the risk factor chunk of them. The rest of the relative risk, I do have chunk, uh, more things as well. One to two relative risk. So I won't say this is less important, but compared to four relative risk, definitely less important. And what has happened, unfortunately, is we have, as a community, we are focusing on this part, one to two relative risk. The one to two relative risk is your obesity, your uh, sedentary lifestyle, early menarche, late menopause, late first pregnancy, nullipality, not breastfeeding, alcohol, everything comes in this place. One to two relative risk, right? Everything as you might have heard, obesity is a relative risk. You have an early menarche. The combination of early menarche and late menopause is a relative risk. I'll tell you what I am trying to achieve by putting up all these together. Okay. Then you have your uh, nulli parity that also increases relative risk. Again, just one to two uh, relative risk. That's all. Avoiding breastfeeding. Okay. This also increases the relative risk. Sedentary lifestyle, all this increases the relative risk. So what I'm trying to convey by all these is, for all these, if you look, the common denominator is hyperestrogenism. It's just that's all, right? It's hyperestrogenism. That is the common denominator here. More adipose tissue, more amount of active estrogen. Nulli parity. If a woman gives birth during the postpartum period and during lactation, estrogen falls. Early menarche, late menopause, same reason, estrogen is more. At the end of the day, most of these relative risk of 2 to 4, so 1 to 2 increases estrogen. And what will estrogen do to the breast parenchyma? It causes increased proliferation. So that's how it results in formation of or increases the risk of breast cancer. None of these are etiology, they are only risk. Which means a person who is not giving birth to a kid, not getting pregnant, is not always going to end up in breast cancer. There's a chance one or two times more risk of having breast cancer compared to a general population, right? So this is how the etiology is, right? Pathogenesis is same thing. It's an uh, BRCA1, BRCA2 are actually DNA repair genes. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are actually, uh, one and two are actually your DNA repair genes. So when my DNA repair genes are mutated, are not effective, obviously it is going to give rise to more and more and more mutation which results in cancer formation. That's how that causes and all these sporadic risks is going to coin on the hyper estrogenic effect only, fine? So we know the etiopathogenesis. Before going to the IDC and uh, DCS, I just want to have a little bit information about the clinical symptoms. Because when you, uh, like I said, breast cancer is a very high chance of getting, uh, uh, coming in university exams is a long answer. Not as a short answer, as a three mark question. And most of your long answers are based on a clinical scenario, right? So when you have a patient who's an elderly, above 50 years, okay, a firm to hard mass, that's important. This mass is not mobile, immobile, or it is attached to the underlying tissue, or it's having skin changes, overlying skin changes, there's puckering of skin. I'm sure you must have heard about something called pure dew orange. You must have read them even in your anatomy, right? Pure dew orange, like puckering of skin or there's a bl bloody nipple discharge. The nipple, there's a blood discharge. All these points out in an elderly woman, I want to suspect breast cancer. Young age bloody nipple discharge, there are a few other differential diagnoses as well. But you have these in a woman about 40 or 50 or above, you think of a breast cancer. So if I clinically suspect breast cancer, what do I do? The next step obviously is biopsy. 
in reality the role of fnac is almost nil but maybe in an exam if the examiner asks say fnac uh, fnac can say it's cancer but biopsy is this day because uh, I, have you heard about how many of you here has heard about erpr hertonium have you heard about that er pr and hertonium if you have heard about erpr and hertonium you know for a fact that i need that to start treatment for breast cancer and that cannot be done on an fnac i need a biopsy that's why i said leave fnac maybe when you come to your internship i hope fnac in breast disappears totally it's very redundant investigation which is not going to help me in the long run fine right? i'm going to do a biopsy based on the biopsy you diagnose then you're going to treat the patient that's the entire flow of treating a breast cancer patient right so when you take a biopsy when you look at the microscopy i want you to understand the staging in cervix what we read was we had can1 can2 can3 cervical cancer as day we saw about it or a l cell h cell and cervical cancer like that what happens in your breast carcinomas the normal thing is called as tdlu tdlu stands for terminal duct lobular unit okay it's tdlu that's how it is terminal duct lobular unit this is a normal breast parenchyma structure fine so now here i'll tell you what happens in breast cancer so from this tdlu let's draw a tdlu let's assume this this is a duct and this is a asanai this is how tdlu looks like and throughout this asanai you'll have epithelium just for understanding i'll use a different color maybe i'll zoom this i'll use a different color this green are my epithelial lining right two of this asanai i'm going to have epithelium this epithelium will function the function of the epithelium is simple to help in milk secretion once the milk is secreted via the duct it goes to the nipple area complex right understood this is a normal histology of breast so this breast lesion what's going to happen is whenever there's a risk or a mutation or due to BRCA1 it becomes neoplastic when it becomes neoplastic the first stage is same TDLU the only thing is it becomes bigger because proliferation right it becomes bigger and here the tumor cells it's same pleomorphism high NC ratio everything becomes here right the tumor becomes very big and pleomorphic here now here in this stage it has not crossed the TDLU it's still inside the TDLU. So tell me, I want you guys to comment on this. This is an in situ lesion or an invasive lesion? Like I said, it has not crossed the TDLU, it is staying within the TDLU. It is in situ or invasion? Perfect, this is in situ. Amazing. This is in situ. So when I say it's in situ, I call this DCIS ductal carcinoma in situ because this is a duct, terminal ductal lobular unit. And it's in situ inside, it has not gone outside, right? That's your DCS, ductal carcinoma in situ. There's a very important variant of DCS, cousin, Comido DCS. This is one of the important variants of DCS, then very high grade DCS, just for us to remember. Okay? It happens in the center, there'll be necrosis, that's your thing. So, next thing, tell me what is the next step? This tumor should grow. Yes? The next step is invasion, obviously. So, next step, there are two possible things for me. One, this tumor cell can go here, it can invade, it can invade the breast parenchyma or can I say this tumor cell can also grow into the duct, is there a possibility, it can go via the duct and go to the nipple area complex, yes there are two possibilities right, so this DCS has two outcomes, one it can become IDC, IDC stands for infiltrating ductal carcinoma, okay or I can go into the duct and into the nipple area complex. We call it a Paget's disease of breast. Okay. That's a Paget's disease of breast where you'll have a spread into the nipple area complex. Okay. It's an it's spreading into the skin. That's all. Okay. By the nipple, it involves the skin of the breast parenchyma. Right. So there are two ways of growth. You can go into the nipple area complex, spread via the duct, or you can get invaded. So it is invaded, I call it a cancer, breast cancer, infiltrating ductal carcinoma, that's how we call it. So when I report an infiltrating ductal carcinoma, I have two broad variations in reporting. One I call it IDC NOS. NOS is not otherwise specified. It's not specified what it is, it's a non-specified tumor. Other one is special types. Okay. So in special types, 
I am sure you must have heard about lobular carcinoma of breast. Lobular carcinoma is a special type of breast cancer. I know a variation. Then I have a variant called as tubular carcinoma of breast. They'll have lots and lots of tubules there. I have a variation called as mucinous carcinoma of breast. It will be fully filled with mucin. That's a variation. There's a tumor called as medullary carcinoma of breast. That's a variation. Again, all these just name the subtypes. For an undergraduate level, I don't expect the uniqueness of every cancer. If you know it's great, but if you at least know that, okay, it was DCIS initially, it invaded or went to the skin called pages. Once it's invaded, I call it NOS, no specific type, not otherwise specified. Or it goes to your special type. Yes, Kaizen, the most common is obviously an IDC NOS, no special type or not otherwise specified, fine. Now if it's special type, I have to write what is a special type, fine. Okay, there are a few words, I'll uh, talk about each of them. This is your central necrosis. And here, if you see, there's a one asana of the TDLU. There's no invasion here. So what is this? There's no invasion here at all. It's very, very well circumscribed, right? So this IDC or DCAS? Can anyone comment? Medico, Opsal, Rushil, Kaiser. This IDC or DCAS? It is perfect. This is a classical example of Comido. Comido is central. You must have heard about Comido in your black head and white head and pimple. That's Comido, right? The center or the tip of it has necrosis. That's Comido DCS, right? Let's go to one more image just for us to understand. In this image, let's come to the diagnosis. Slowly, one by one. What is the common color you see? This comment on the common color. Is it pink? Is it blue? Or is it clear? Perfect, Rushi. It's mostly clear areas, right? So what I'm seeing here is mostly these clear areas. These clear areas here are your mucin. Okay? The mucin, right? So, uh, okay, then these are the areas we're talking about. Maybe a little bit of purplish background or hue does. It's mostly the clear mucinous area. So this, I'm going to call it a subtype mucinous carcinoma of breast. Mucinous carcinoma is a very, very, very good prognosis. It's not a very aggressive tumor. It has a good prognosis, right? This mucinous carcinoma of breast. It's fully in mucin. And these tiny ones are your tumor cells. You'll see tumor cells, the exact description is floating in a sea of mucin. It looks like that, right? That's mucinous carcinoma of breast, right? So we take a lobular carcinoma. There are few pointers I want you to look at lobular carcinoma. Look for this in your uh, history in your university exam as well. Lobular carcinoma tends to be more bilateral than a ductal carcinoma. I'm not saying ductal carcinoma cannot be bilateral. It is more than ductal carcinoma. It's a little bit more bilateral. Lobular carcinoma of breast has CDH1 mutation and this mutation results in loss of a protein called as e -cadenin. The function of e cadenin I am sure you know, it is cell addition, right? It's cell addition. With loss of e cadenin, no cell addition. That's why from one breast parenchyma, it can easily move to the other breast. Bilaterality is more common, right? Okay. Grossly, it will be a very, very ill-defined lesion. It's not a defined one, it's completely ill-defined. On examination also, it will just be a vague swelling, not a defined swelling at all. Perfect. Like Kaysen said, microscopy, because it's loss of e cadenin, it's not able to adhere and form a mass, it's completely lost. You'll have tumors like this. Normally tumors will be like this. That's how we normally draw tumors, right? It's a cluster. But what happens here is, it becomes like this. A single file pattern or an Indian file appearance. Okay. Okay. I just want uh, you to answer this one just an important question IHC. If I'm going to do e cadenin IHC in this patient, suspected lobular carcinoma of breast, e cadenin will be positive or negative? Keep in mind the pathogenesis talks about only one thing when there's no e cadenin, I'm going to have lobular carcinoma. What should happen to uh, IHC of lobular carcinoma of breast, positive or negative? Perfect, it should be negative. Please keep this in mind. E cadenin is IHC which I'm going to look for, and E cadenin should be negative because if it's only negative, I can say there's a loss of function mutation, and I'm going to think of a lobular carcinoma. If it's positive, I think of a ductal carcinoma, right? E IHC E cadenin will be negative in case of lobular carcinoma. So we have seen few special types and IDC endomas. Let's just go to molecular classification. Ideally, molecular classification should be done on gene expression arrays, which we don't have in our in our lab. So we use a surrogate finding of IHC. Though it's not the right way, but we use immunohistochemistry chemistry to classify. Okay? So we do three things. ERPR, that's one. ER2 new, that's other one. And K2 
K I sixty seven. Generally, people don't consider K six seven; they ignore K six seven. But I want you to remember K six seven for sure. Right? Okay. So uh, do remember K six seven. Just don't ignore that because K six seven is very very important for me to differentiate few subtypes. Right? So let's take. There are four subtypes. One is called as luminal A. We'll go with the simple subtypes. We're not going to complicated ones. Luminal A is the most common subtype, and luminal A has the best prognosis as well. Right? Let's say something is luminal A. It is ERPR positive. It's negative for HER2, and K is you know, less than fourteen percent. KI67 is a proliferating index. It's nothing but a proliferation index. Okay, that's what KI67 is. It's a proliferation index. When I say less than fourteen, less proliferation. Yes, that's why the best prognosis. Right? Now, if you look luminal B, generally people tend to write only one in luminal B. Actually, luminal B has two categories. Either it's ERPR positive, HER2 negative, more than or equal to fourteen percent of KI67, or ERPR positive, HER2 positive, any KI67. Whatever KI67 is, if all three are positive, it goes into luminal B. Luminal B has a slightly less prognosis. Right? The third two is third is HER2 new. Amplified okay. or her to new enriched. From the name her to new enriched, I'm sure you know what what is positive for. It's positive only for her to new. Any K, any K, but her to positive. E R P R negative. We call it her to enriched. Last one is triple negative. Okay. So triple negative breast cancer is E R P R negative, her to negative. Again K I anything. The reason why molecular classification is very very important for any breast cancer patient. And this can be done only on a biopsy. That's why I said that biopsy is very, very important for me before uh, before starting the management. So please don't do FNAC. Okay? If a tumor is positive for ERPR, I can suggest hormonal therapy for the patient. If the tumor is positive for HER2, we can give antibodies to HER2. You, I am sure you must have heard about trastuzumab. I can give trastuzumab for the patient. If everything is negative, nothing can be given. So obviously, triple negative is the worst prognosis. The only thing I can give is some random chemotherapy and surgery. That's the worst prognosis amongst all the breast cancers. Fine. Okay. That's how we classify your breast cancers: ERPR and HER2. Fine. Okay. Amazing. So that brings us to the end of breast cancer discussion. If you have any doubts, do let me know. Otherwise, we'll call it a day. I'm I've covered most of the required things in breast cancer.